Hello and welcome to Skills and Automation. My name is Ash and today we're going to learn Excel VBA through code. In fact, we're going to design and automate a real world reporting process using Excel VBA. This is an absolute beginners project. We will start from scratch and cover each essential concept as we move along through the project. VBA is a great programming tool to use in the office environment. It helps automate repetitive tasks such as the one we are about to build and it can take your work productivity to the next level. But getting started is always challenging. Do you try studying all the concepts first or do you just record a macro and try to play around with the backend code? And what if something breaks? So much uncertainty. This video course is designed to take you straight into the heart of VBA. We will methodically go from building our first hello world macro to extracting raw data, converting it into a report and then sending it off to our teammates via Outlook. I am really excited to present this course. So let's get started. You may have some or no prior VBA experience. No problem. We will start from the very beginning. And once you complete this project, you will have gained a beginner to intermediate level skill set in VBA. As a prerequisite though, a beginner level knowledge of Excel is required. But don't be mistaken, the final outcome that we are about to build is a full-fledged end-to-end project feature-packed with a variety of VBA code. We will start off by quickly covering off some basic concepts and then dive straight into the code. The idea is to get your hands dirty right off the bat and learn through the actual code rather than just study all the dry concepts. My approach here is the same I would take while knowledge sharing with a work colleague with the end objective that at the end of the session, that colleague should be able to perform the task independently by themselves. On completion of this project, you will have become a VBA developer. Sure, we may not cover all the concepts, but you don't need to know all of that at this stage. We will cover enough ground for you to be confident enough to build your own code. The path forward after this is to Google or YouTube for help. But then again, that's how you landed up on this video. So I don't need to tell you that. You are already on the right track. Just keep going. In the next segment, we'll have a brief look at few of the concepts that we are about to cover. There is so much to learn here. We will start off with a bit of theory regarding the basics, where we will learn how to refer to cells, sheets, and Excel files through code. We will also learn how the use of variables will make our code more efficient and easier to read. Then we will step up our game and start manipulating our cells, sheets, and files. We will detect data ranges, open close files, copy paste data, and create and save new files. And we are not even close to being done yet. Next up is the intermediate level where we start programming using logic. We will manipulate text strings, use if conditions, use for loops, and use functions such as find. And there is so much knowledge scattered throughout the course. This mostly revolves around code debugging where we learn how to keep testing our code as we move along, I'll be sharing practical tips and tricks to help you build code safely and confidently. And wait, there's more. We will go through the ever so crucial checks for bad data. Every good programmer should include error handling in their code. And lastly, we won't just be confined to Excel. The beauty of VBA is its ability to seamlessly interact with other office applications. In our project, we will connect to Outlook do some cool tricks and finally send out an email. But the learning doesn't stop at this video. I've put in every effort to build a solid amount of resources available to you outside this video. Let's check that out in the next segment. All the code covered in this video will be available on my blog site skillsandautomation.com. Link will be available in the description below. But let's quickly check out the blog post. We have a table of contents on the right. The video will come in soon. The sections from Setup VB Editor through to variables act as a cheat sheet for the theory section that we are about to cover. The five macro sections out here are like a commentary for the code that we are about to build. There will be a line or two describing each section of code. It is written in the same sequence in which we would build our code. So it's a good place to understand the logic of how we approach code building. And finally, you have the uninterrupted code at the bottom. You can literally come here and paste it all into your file. I have designed this so that you can sit back, 
relax and watch this video and concentrate on the logic of what we are building rather than worrying about noting down the code. This video is a product of all the great feedback I've received on my previous videos. So if you have any questions related to this video, please write it down in the comments below. I will do my best to answer them as long as it's manageable. For common questions on this video course, I can compile them and create an FAQ page on my blog site and provide the link here. Let's see how it goes. All the files used in this video are available on my GitHub page. Let's have a look at it as well. The GitHub link will be in the description below, but we can go to it from here as well. So this is the GitHub page for this video course. I will suggest that you go through this readme section. It will tell you which of these files is what. And the files are out here. To download the file, just click on them and then click download. And that should download your file. What we have here are the three report template macro files with completed code. I also have the report template file without the code, which you can download and then use it to follow along this course. And finally, you can find the supporting files loaded out here as well. In the next segment, let's have a look at the layout for this video. This video is divided into four sections. First up, the big picture. I feel that it is important to have a clear picture of what we are about to build. With that in mind, we'll start off by looking at the business scenario, where we'll talk about how an analyst would perform the steps manually. Then we'll move on to the automation approach, where we'll plan out what logic to use and which macros to build. There are going to be five macros in total. And finally, we look at a demo of what the end-to-end -end automation is going to look like. For the next section, before we dive into the code, we need to cover off some basics. We will set up the coding environment and then move on to talking about objects and variables in VPA. Please feel free to skip the parts that you might already know. And then we will start with the actual macro build. As we will go through in the automation approach, we require three macros to perform the basic operations as outlined in the scenario. We will build these in this section. At the end, we will have a semi-automated process that is run in three steps. Import data, create a copy of the report, and email the copy of the report. And in our last bonus section, we have two bonus macros. The first one will include ways to detect user-related errors. And in the second one, we will combine everything we have done so far and build an end-to-end -end fully automated process. Hope this sounds interesting. And let's begin the video course. It is the end of the accounting month. We have downloaded the full month's sales numbers for all our stores into an Excel file. This report is in raw format, probably out of an ERP. As an analyst, we need to copy the data from this file and paste it into our report template file. This template has a lot of formulas and there is also a table summarizing the sales by region and product. Next, we need to save a copy of this template with only the relevant worksheets and without any formulas. And finally, we will email the copy to the rest of our team. For the solution, we turn to VBA to automate the task. Why VBA? My personal rule for VBA is that as long as you can break down a process into logical steps, we can automate it. And as a constraint, we are not supposed to make any changes to the template file. All the formulas, formatting, etc. will need to remain intact. This is actually a great constraint. It will show you how to use VBA to organically interact with Excel. You can leverage your Excel skills to build templates with formulas in Excel and use VBA to automate only the repetitive tasks. So for the next segment, we will look at the automation approach that we are going to follow with the various steps involved. We will follow a three-step automation approach. Our starting point is an Excel file with the sales figures for the current month. Our assumption is that we have already downloaded the data and saved the file in the same folder as our template macro file. In the first step, we will build a macro to copy the data from the sales file and paste it into our template macro file. Next, we will save a copy of the report in our folder. And in the final step, we will email the copy of the report to our recipients. And this in itself is a complete end-to-end -end process and you can very well stop the video there having gained a beginner level skill set. But 
we can do much more with this. I want to keep the scenario realistic. When coding in VBA, it is recommended to check for errors, especially those that can break the automation. We can look at how to add error handling in this bonus section. An example for a user error is, what if you have saved a blank data file by mistake? If you don't check for that and automate the whole process, we will end up sending a blank report to our bosses. And we don't want that. So in this bonus step, we will check for this and a few other errors. The logical question to ask at this point is, can we combine all of this together? Sure, we can. In fact, it's very easy. We can program a mega macro which runs these four individual macros back to back. So at the very end, we will combine everything and run it in one fully automated process. And yes, I'm confident that even though you may never have coded VBA before, you will still be able to build this full application by following this video course. And before we move on to the next segment, I just want to highlight that you don't need to aim for end-to-end -end automation. Yes, include some error checks, but you can still break up the process into separate macros. That way, you can visually confirm if each macro ran and whether it's given the desired output. Sometimes you may encounter errors which you had not predicted before. And sometimes you may want to visually inspect the data, for example, to see if the report values make sense from a financial perspective before actually sending it to your manager. So my strong, strong suggestion will be that you build such projects in separate steps. You will still be able to save a lot of time and repetitive work. But that being said, we will most definitely look at how to run everything in one go because end-to-end -end automation is cool, awesome, and 100% satisfying. Now, let's look at a demo of what we are about to build. This is the folder that we are gonna work in. The rule here is that we will place our sales file and our macro files and the report copy that we are about to create within the same folder. We can see three macro files out here. The first one, is the basic three-step automation. The second one includes our bonus error handling. And the third one is a complete macro, which combines everything in one step. Let's have a look at the sales file first. We have dates, products, units sold, price, and the store, which registered the sale for the month of July. Now let's open the first template macro file. I have tried to keep this as close to real life as possible. So you will see that it's full of formulas typical of a sales or finance team. And the analysis tab has a lot of some ifs. In other words, a bonanza of VLOOKUPs and some ifs, which are the bread and butter of any good analyst. First, let's look at a data sheet. The data from the sales file will be placed in columns A to E. Column F to H have formulas in them. Column F is calculating revenue, which is units multiplied by price. Column G and H are VLOOKUPs based on the sheet lookups. But we really don't need to know what these formulas are actually doing. What's important to us is that they exist and we're not gonna change them at all. If we copy in new data and if it extends lower than the last formula row, our VVA code will need to drag these formulas down to match the data set. Next, we have the analysis tab which is again full of formulas. It summarizes imported data and compares it versus the sales forecast for that month. Again, we really don't need to know any of this. Just that we're gonna copy data from the analysis and data tabs into our new report file. Now, let's look at the email list tab. These are the recipients that the email is gonna go out to. There are other tabs such as lookup and forecast. These are essential to the template and help with the formulas but from the perspective of the macro, we are not really concerned with it. And lastly, we have the console tab. On the left, we have three buttons. Each represents a step that we have seen in the previous slide. In columns F to G, we can see some data. We expect the user of this file to fill in this data before they run the macros. Cell G1 has the folder name in which we are working. Cell G2 has the name of the file that we are going to import and cell G3 has the name that we are going to save the new report copy as. Our macro will read all of this data and use it at various points. Let's briefly look at how our code looks. Hit Alt F11 to go to the VB editor where our code is saved. Each macro has its own code, which is stored in separate sections called modules. Okay, time to run the macro. 
Let's go to the console sheet. Actually, let's clear the contents of the data sheet. This is not needed. It's just for us to confirm that the data indeed did get copied over. And there are formulas here. What we will do is just delete these formulas. So there's no formula from the row four onwards. So our expectation is that the new data will probably have more than four rows. And in that case, we want the formulas to drag down all the way to the last row of the data. Okay, let's hit the first button, which is to import the data. We get a message that the import is complete. Let's go to the data sheet. All the data did get copied over. So that's working. And before we continue, I just want to show one thing. The formulas in column F to H drag all the way down to the last row, which is row number 29. Okay. Over to the next macro, we can now go ahead and save a copy. Great, copy got created. Let's inspect the file. So the file will be saved as current month file.xlx as specified in cell G3. Let's go to our folder. Great, we can see the file in our folder. Let's open it. There are just two sheets out here, analysis and data. But the point to note here is that there are no formulas anywhere. It's just clean values. Now to the last step, let's send the email. Hit send email. So we can see this email template open up. In the to field, we can see three email IDs that were on our email list worksheet. We can see a subject and some text in the body. But most importantly, our report file has been attached. Now we can hit send and the email will get sent. In our final solution as well, we will just display the email and let the analyst push send. This is safer and avoids the risk of sending emails with error. Now for the second macro, which is our first bonus segment. So these three steps didn't really check for any errors, but it is important to assume the possibility of something going wrong. In this segment, we will check for common errors caused due to user related errors or bad data. Just a disclaimer, there are of course more checks that you can run, but we will not cover the whole lot. I do feel that what we cover here should be good enough though. Sometimes we need to find the right balance and keep ourselves from overcoding. My advice is that approach error handling based on criticality of the process. The greater the criticality, the more time you need to spend on building good error handling. Our error handling file is actually a different file. In the second macro file, let's open this. We have one extra button out here to check for errors. And we have one more extra field where we input the number of columns that we're going to copy over. Okay. These are the checks that we are going to cover. All the values that we saw in the yellow fields, which is what we expect the user to enter must be filled out. None of them can be blank. The source file that the user enters must actually exist. The extension for saving the report copy must be .xlsx. The number of columns in the source file must be same as what we are expecting. And the source file must have some data in it. And lastly, the column header names in the source file must be the same as what we are expecting. So we're going to check for all these six errors. The best way to test this is to break each one and see what we get. So the first condition is that none of these fields can be blank. So what we can do is just blank out this and let's run the error check. We get a message saying that all the values must be entered. Great. Change this back. The import file says August 2021, but we have actually loaded a July 2021 sales file. So just having this should throw an error. Let's try that out. So it says that this file actually doesn't exist in that particular folder, which is correct. Let's just change this. Okay. The third condition is that this extension should be .xlsx. Let's change this to docx, check for errors. So that gets highlighted as well. So this is where we enter the number of columns that we are expecting to import. Our count is five, which is basically these five columns. So the source data cannot be more than five columns. So let's say we're expecting four columns. And now the source data has five columns. So this should throw an error. Okay, that gets picked up as well. Awesome, let's change this back. Or rather, let's go to the source file and add an extra column. Save this. 
Now there's six columns in the source data. Let's check for errors. Again, that gets picked up. Awesome. Let's delete this. Our next condition is that there must be some data at least. So what we can do is blank out all this data and just keep the headers, save the file. So let's now try and check for errors. We get a message saying that there's no data in the source file. And the last condition is that we have five columns out here and each column has a column header. And we are expecting the source file to have the exact same headers in it. So what we can do is go to the source file, change this to a different name, save this, close this. Let's run an error check again. And we get a message saying that this mismatch in column headers. Now let's demo our final macro. And now for the grand finale, the end-to-end -end automation, which is in this third file. There is just one button out here. It is going to check for all the six error conditions that we just saw before. And if all those conditions pass, then our entire process will get triggered and our final email will be displayed. So let's click this button. Oops, looks like we've got an error. Check the error worksheet. The import file doesn't exist. So looks like we don't have an August file out here. We need to change this to July. But that just shows that our error handler is actually working and we actually got the result that we expected. Okay, this should run completely end to end. Let's run it now. It's taking a bit of a time. And boom, our email has been generated. Okay. And that's the demo. Hope this looks interesting and you are intrigued. In the next segment, we'll set up a coding environment, starting with the developer ribbon. In this segment, we will add the developer ribbon to our main Excel ribbon. Let's head on over to our Excel ribbon. Can you see the developer ribbon on it? If you can, then it's already been added for you. However, if your Excel ribbon looks like this and you cannot see the developer ribbon, don't worry. Let's walk through the setup. Go to File, Options, come to Customize Ribbon, search for the Developer option in the right window. Go ahead and tick it. Press OK. Now check in your Ribbon tab. You should be able to see the Developer ribbon in there right now. Let's click on it. You can use it to access the VB Editor, which is the coding environment. But I would suggest just using the shortcut Alt F11. Or you can have a look at all the macros that you have available in your workbook. You can even record a macro from here. As a beginner VBA developer, sometimes recording a macro is actually good just to check what code was generated in the back end. But we won't cover that in the video. We're going to go full hardcore and start writing code directly. The feature in the developer ribbon that we are interested in for this project is adding a button to trigger the macro. So we'll go to insert, form controls, and select the first button looking icon. But we won't do it just yet. Great. Now that we've had a look at the developer ribbon, let's head on over to the VB editor and familiarize ourselves with the coding environment. In this segment, we will go through the setup of our VB editor, which is the place where we'll build all our code. For this project, I recommend that you set up your VB editor in the same way as mine. To access the VB editor, press Alt F11. Let's go from the top to the bottom and from the left to the right of the screen. Top right here is our menu. You will have this by default. Below it is the standard toolbar. It has some good shortcuts that we can access without having to search for them in the menu. If you can't see this toolbar, go to View, Toolbars, and select Standard. Next is the Project Explorer. Out here, we can see our workbook and all the worksheets inside it. We will build our code in here as well in a separate section called Module, which will appear here when we create it. If you can't see the Project Explorer, go to View and select Project Explorer. Below that is the Properties window. In this project, we will use it to rename our module. If you can't see it, go to View and select Properties window. To the right of the Properties window is the Immediate window. This is a great tool for testing code from a macro or in other words, debugging. If you can't see this window, go to View and select Immediate window. And this big gray space in between is where we'll place the coding window where we will write out our code. But for that, we need to create a module. Come to the Project Explorer, right click, insert, and select module. 
a new branch called modules opens up in a project explorer with one module in it. In this gray area, will now have become white. This indicates that we are working in the coding window related to this module. And if your view looks like a window inside the gray area, just click the maximize button out here. In my coding window, you can see that I have option explicit written right at the top. This is a useful setting which will force us to declare all our variables. If you can't see it, go to tools, options, and in the editor tab, check require variable declaration. And while you're here, untick the auto syntax check if it's ticked for you. This disables the notifications that we get if there is any syntax error. Though it is a recommended setting for beginners, I suspect it may cause some interference while talking through this tutorial. Also, to keep your setting aligned with mine, we will uncheck this. Click OK and our setup is done. In the next segment, let's create and run our first Hello World macro. Before we move on to the next segment, let's write a simple macro from scratch. Our macro will be written inside a sub procedure, which is like a container of code that is designed to perform some action or actions. A sub procedure starts with the word sub and ends with the words n sub. Let's make our first sub procedure now. So we are going to create a sub procedure inside the module that we had created in the last segment. If you don't have this up, just go right click, insert and module. So below our option explicit line, let's write and assign a name to the sub, no spaces and press enter. You will have noticed two things. First, we have an open and closed parenthesis after the name of the sub and the words n sub appeared at the bottom. If you're ever copying a macro from somewhere and forget to copy the n sub lines, you'll need to type these out yourself. And we'll ignore the significance of the parenthesis for this video. All we need to know is that our code is going to sit in between these two lines. Okay, so what should we do for our first macro? Let's display a message in Excel. The code for a message box is message box and we need to write a message to display press the space bar any text or words need to go inside two double quotes and we'll type the text hello world to run this macro now keep your cursor within this sub come up to the standard toolbar and press the run button the message box appears on our excel screen press ok on the message and if your excel screen doesn't appear automatically Open the Excel screen from the taskbar below and click OK. Unless you click OK, the macro will remain in the running mode. And that was the first macro. And just one thing, I've already saved this file, which is basically the blank template that we are going to use for our project. However, we'll just go through the extension that we should be saving our micro files as. Let's go to File, Save As. So this is an already saved file. Normally, you'll be used to saving your Excel workbooks as .xlsx, but if you have written your macro code, you could traditionally save this file as a macro enabled workbook with the extension .xlsm. However, I actually prefer the Excel binary workbook option, which is .xlsp. This allows us to save macros in the Excel workbook. And this type of file also compresses data, which is real handy when you're working with big Excel files it almost reduces the file size by two or three times. So whenever I am using macros, I save them as .xlsp. But for this project, you could save it as anything, xlsm or xlsp, it will still work. And that was our first macro. Before we start building the macro for our project, we will need to cover a few more basics. In the next segment, we will look at how to refer to worksheets and cells. Excel follows hierarchy and each element within that hierarchy is called an object. First, let's look at a context from the real world and we'll circle back to VBA later. Imagine you live in a city called Wellington. Wellington has many streets and you stay on Denim Street. Denim Street has many houses and you live in house 52B. In VBA terms, city, street and house are referred to as objects and the object hierarchy is city, street and house. Let's look at Excel VBA. Our Excel file is called a workbook and the name of our current file is monthlyanalysis.xlsp. Our workbook has many worksheets. Let's say we're only concerned with a sheet called data. 
This sheet has many cells. A cell or a group of cells is referred to as a range in VBA. You have cells as well, but we won't get into that now. And let's say, for now, we are only concerned with range C2. Here, workbook, worksheet and range are VBA objects. And the hierarchy would be workbook, worksheet and range. Well, technically the parent object is the Excel application itself. But we aren't required to mention it in the code, so we'll ignore it for this scenario. For our purposes, the main object hierarchy that we will be concerned with in this project is workbook, worksheet and range. Now suppose you bought some goods online and the company contact person calls you up and asks you for your address to deliver the goods to you. Let's say you answer 52B. That person is probably just going to stare into their phone with disbelief because that would make no sense whatsoever. Let's say you answer 52B Denim Street. The next question from the contact person would naturally be which city? So the proper way to answer that question would be 52B Denim Street, Wellington. In other words, for the goods to be delivered to your house, you need to give the full address. And if you wanted to do this in VBS style language, you would go out of all the cities in the world, you stay in Wellington. And out of all the streets in Wellington, you stay on Denim Street. And out of all the houses on Denim Street, you stay at 52B. I hope you're getting the idea. And I'll let you in on a secret. There are no cities, streets or houses in VBA. The equivalent code for this in VBA is workbooks, workbook name, sheets, sheet name, range, and the cell you want to refer to, or the group of cells that you want to refer to. Now, let's look at the actual code in VBA. First, in our Excel data sheet, we want to display the value in cell C2. To do this, we need to provide the full address, including range, worksheets, and workbook. Alt F11 to go to the VBA editor. We have a blank sub out here. Let's do a message box. Out of all the workbooks, we are referring to our current macro file dot. Out of all the sheets in this macro file, we are referring to the worksheet data. And out of all the cells in this worksheet, we are referring to cell C2. And from the cell, we want to derive its value. So for that, we will go dot and value. Okay, let's run this. We get the message 293, which is the correct value in cell C2. Press OK. But if you're referring to a sheet within the same Excel file in which your code sits, then you don't need to provide the file name. We can just delete this off and simply say this workbook. Let's run this code. The same value gets displayed. And now you can cheat here a little. Sometimes you don't even need to write this workbook. If your file with the code is the one that is active or rather it's the currently selected file, then you can directly refer to the sheet. So at the moment, we just have one file open. So naturally, this file is our current file. In that case, we can remove this part as well and just use sheets and range. Let's play this. Same value gets displayed. Let's go a step further. As long as you're referring to a cell in the active worksheet or the currently selected worksheet, you can directly refer to the range. So as long as the data sheet is selected, we don't even need to specify sheets data. Let's remove this and just play this. 293. But there are some rules around directly referencing the worksheet and range objects. So once we begin our project code, we will use full references. So that is the Excel object model that we will refer to in this project. It's pretty much the foundation of everything we are about to do because Excel VBA is all about interacting with workbook, sheets and cells. Before we move on, it is important to note that these are not the only objects within Excel. The Excel application, workbook and worksheet have other objects under them as well, forming their own hierarchies. But realistically, on a beginner level, we would most likely spend all our time on the workbook, worksheet and range hierarchy. Also, as a part of this project, we will be sending an Outlook email as well. The Outlook email is an object that's part of the parent Outlook application object. We will learn how to connect to the Outlook application and use the email object to fill a blank email template and send an email. But for now, we will continue with our Excel object model. Next, we will look at how to manipulate data with or within these objects by learning about their properties, 
and methods. Let us consider this cell C2, which is a range object. It has a value of 293. The background color is yellow. The row is of a certain height. The font is black, etc. These are all its characteristics, which are called properties of the object. But we can also do something with this cell. We can control C and copy its value or just delete and clear its contents. Both of these are methods to put a definition to it. A method is some action that we want to perform with the object. Similar to the range object, both the worksheet and the workbook object have their own properties and methods. For example, we can close a workbook, which is a method of the workbook object. Now a question that you might ask is, do we need to remember all the properties and methods for each and every object? The answer is no. We have a handy feature in VBA called IntelliSense, which will help us with this. Let's look at the code. So let's write out our reference to cell C2, which is the range C2 on the data sheet. Now press a dot, a list pops up. This list is called IntelliSense and it gives us all the properties and methods available for that object. Now, of course, you need to have an idea of what you're looking for. Say you would just want to display the value in the cell. Let's start typing value and there we have it. If you see this hand with an envelope, at least I think that's what it is, then it's a property. So tab and that's selected. We can also select a method. Say we want to clear the contents, start typing clear. There it is. And this box that appears to be flying away in a hurry indicates that this is a method. We wouldn't display the method. We would actually just perform that action. So let's play this and see what happens. Come back to our sheet and the value in the cell has been cleared. Great. That was all about objects and their properties and methods. Next, we will look at variables because we are going to rely on them a lot in this project. A variable allows us to store the value of an object or the object itself for later use. Now, before we continue, I'm going to talk about how and why I use variables. This reflects my own personal approach to VBA coding, which I would like to share here. There are two reasons why I use variables. One is to avoid repeating code. And second, and the most important reason is to improve readability. First, let's look at this statement. Now, I know we haven't even gotten to if statements yet, but simply put, what we are doing here is checking whether the values in cell G1 or cell G2 or cell G3 on our console sheet are blank or not. Even if one of them is, then we will display a message saying that all values in column G must be entered. So basically, we want the user to enter a value in each of these fields in column G. The point here is that this looks like too much information and we can't really tell what values we are actually checking for. What is actually G1, G2 or G3? Sure, at the time of writing the code, we probably knew what the values were in the cells. But if you have to come back to check this code in a few months, heck, even in 10 minutes, you'd be scratching your head trying to remember what these values represent. Perhaps best would be to open the worksheet, go to the console sheet and check for yourself. But this is counterproductive. And imagine trying to investigate a hundred lines of code like this. A better way to deal with this is assign meaningful variable names to these values so that we can instantly recognize where they are from within the code itself. So cell G1 is the full folder path where our files are saved. So let's deal with that one first. There are two steps to assigning a variable. We need to first declare to VBA that we want to create a new variable. We can do that using a dim statement. And then in step two, we can assign a value to it. So dim and we can give our own name to the variable. Some important rules here are no spaces allowed. Keep it to letters and numbers and don't use reserved words from the VBA language itself. So basically we cannot name a variable as sub, end, message box, dim, etc. We will call this variable main folder. And then we need to say what data type we are going to store in this variable. There are many data types as shown on this Microsoft Docs page. The ones that we are going to stick to for this project are string for text, 
and long for whole numbers. So our folder path is a text value and we can give it a string data type. Now let's assign the value in cell G1 to this variable. So we will go the variable name is equal to, and I'm going to copy this, which is basically the value in cell G1. And actually let's pause here and divert ourselves just for a sec. We can see that this text turned red, which means that there is some syntax error out here. Basically, if you have an equal to, then there needs to be something after that. So VB is expecting me to place something out here to complete this line of code. So for now, we just stepped out just for a sec to copy this value, control C and control V. So we are assigning the value in cell G1 to our newly created variable. And now we can use this variable inside our code. So we're gonna copy this variable name, delete this ugly looking statement and paste it here. And then instantly that looks better. We know exactly what this value is that we're checking for in the if statement. And it looks so much clearer compared to the rest of the cell values. Let's go ahead and replace these as well. Cell G2 is the import file name and cell G3 is the report file name. And we will declare two variables that basically remind us of those values. We can declare variables on separate lines like this or in the same line within the same dim statement like this. Let's delete this. So we can use the same dim statement to declare multiple variables, but we do need to declare the data types explicitly. Now let's assign each of them values. When using variables, I'll recommend just copying and pasting them instead of typing them out so that there is no spelling mistake. So the import file is the value in cell G2. The report file name is the value in cell G3. And now that we have declared and assigned them, we can go ahead and replace them within the if statement. Wow, this looks so much better and easier on the eyes. We can instantly tell that in this statement, we are checking if the main folder value is blank or whether the import file is blank or whether the report file name is blank or not. One important thing to note here is that if we declare a variable using the dim statement, it will be available only inside this sub procedure. Now, a VBA module can have multiple sub procedures and a VBA project can have multiple modules. There are ways to make the variable available inside other subs or to other modules, but we will leave that as out of scope for this project. Next, let's look at assigning variables to objects. The reason to do this is to avoid repeating code. Let's assign variables to our worksheets. This will be a common occurrence in all the macros we are about to build. We will first decide what worksheets we are going to use in that macro and then assign an object variable to each one of them. Let's assign a variable for our data sheet. This is a two step process. In the first step, we will declare a variable as the object we are about to use it for. So again, dim, we'll give the variable a name, again, give it a meaningful name and we'll declare this as the worksheet object. Just a handy tip out here. When I'm referring to workbooks, worksheets or ranges, I put a little prefix in front of the variable so that I know that this is actually a worksheet. And for the next step, we will use the set statement to assign it to the worksheet. So set the variable and then we'll add the reference to our data worksheet. By doing this, all the properties and methods that are available to the worksheet object can now be used by this WS data object variable. So let's highlight or select cell D6 in the data worksheet. For that, we will refer to our worksheet data variable dot and immediately we can see our IntelliSense pop up. We can choose range. We want to select cell D6 dot and from the IntelliSense, choose the select method. 
okay let's run this come to our data worksheet and we can see that the cell d6 has been selected and that's it for using variables if it's not yet clear don't worry we will be using them often in our project code and their advantages will get clearer as we move along okay we have now completed our theory section now it's time to get our hands dirty and start coding excited i sure am Before we start coding the macro, let's have a look at our raw files first. This is our project folder path. These are our source monthly files with sales data in them. And this is our template file. Let's open the template file. So this is our data tab. We are going to paste our data between columns A and E. Columns F onwards have formulas in them. We have an analysis tab, which has a table which summarizes the data from the data sheet. There is an email list of all the team members we're going to send out our email to. There is a forecast tab which feeds into the analysis tab. And there is a lookup worksheet which has a lookup tables for the VLOOKUP formulas in the data worksheet. We're going to create a code within this file and for this file to be macro compatible. That is, in order for us to run macros from this file, we need to save this as a .xlsp or .xlsm file. Go to file, save as. You could choose the macro enabled workbook or the binary workbook. My personal preference is the binary workbook. We're going to create three versions of this file. So the first one is going to be the three step automation. So we'll rename this accordingly. Click save. Now let's create a worksheet. We're going to call this console. This is going to act like a control worksheet from where we're going to run our macros and from where the macro is going to pick up user input data. So if you remember the demo, we had some values in column G. Let's add those in. This is going to be the folder path where our template file, our source file, and our report copy is going to be saved. So this is just this file path, control V. Next up is the name of the import file. For starters, we'll import the July sales data. Copy this file name. And last is the report file name. This is the name by which we're going to save the report copy. We will call it current month file and note the extension, which is .xlsx. And normally for fields where we want the user to input some data, it would pay to highlight them with a different color. Okay. And that's our console sheet. Now we're ready to begin our coding. The objective of this macro is to open the file from this folder in cell G1 with this file name in cell G2 copy the data from it and place it into our existing workbook into the worksheet data within columns A and E. Now, there are formulas in column F onwards. These need to remain intact. If the data rows are greater than the number of formula rows, for example, in this case right here, then we will drag the formulas all the way down to the last row. So let's begin with heading over to the VB editor. Alt F11. We will build a macro inside of a separate module. Let's create a first module. Right click in the project explorer. Insert module. You will see a new branch for modules open up below your worksheets with module one in it. Let's give this a suitable name. Click on module one, then come down to the properties window and again its name. Let's type in M01 import. We will build the entire first macro inside one sub procedure. Let's write it out. A sub procedure begins with the word sub. We will call our macro import data and press enter. We get a parenthesis and the end sub lines and all our code is going to go in between these two lines. For this macro, we will need to access two worksheets from our current workbook, sheet console and sheet data. Let's declare and assign a variable for each worksheet. We will declare the variable using the Tim statement and give it a name WS cons. Remember to assign meaningful names to your variables that are easy to recognize. And when I'm naming worksheets, I normally start them with the prefix WS. And since we are going to assign a worksheet to this variable, the data type for this variable will be a worksheet. Similarly, we can declare a variable for the data worksheet. These don't need to be in separate lines. We can delete the second dim, add in a comma, 
We can declare multiple variables in the same dim statement, but just remember to declare the data types for each variable. And since worksheet is an object, in order to assign it to a variable, we need to use the set statement equals to. Now we're going to assign the worksheet console to this worksheet variable. So we need to provide the reference for the console worksheet, remembering the Excel object model. So we'll start with the workbook, this workbook. And within this workbook, we're after the worksheet by the name console. And similarly, we can assign the data worksheet to the data worksheet variable. Since the declaration is quite similar, I'll just copy the statement, enter, paste, and come here and change this to data and change this to data as well. Now, we need to grab the folder path and the file names from cells G1 and G2 on the console sheet. So cell G1 here has the folder path and cell G2 has the file name. And when I say grab, I actually mean assign a variable to each of them. Cell G1 and G2 have text values. So we will declare string variables for them. So dim again. We'll call the variable for cell G1 as main folder and declare it as a string. And the variable in G2, we'll call it import file and as a string variable as well. Now let's assign a value for each one. Since these aren't objects, the set statement is not required. So we can type in main folder, but since we're using variables, I'd rather just copy and paste it to avoid any spelling mistakes. And we'll follow the Excel object hierarchy. So we'll reference the console worksheet, which we have a variable for dot cell G1, which is range. And what do we want to do with this range? We want to grab its value, which is a property. And we can do the same thing for the import file variable. I'm just going to copy this line again, paste it, change this to G2 and change this to import file. Now, if you want to check whether these variables are grabbing the right values, we can print out their values down here in the image window. The command to print something in the image window is debug.print and we'll grab the main folder variable and debug.print again, this time the import file. So keeping our cursor within the sub procedure, let's run this macro. So we can see the folder path and the file name which are the exact same values in G1 and G2. So these variables seem to be grabbing the right values. Let's delete this and clear the image window. Now we have a folder name and a file name, but to access the file in order to open it, we will need the full file path. That is the folder and the file name joined or concatenated together. Let's do that we will declare a new string variable to hold this full file name. Dim again. We'll call it full source file name. It'll be a string variable. To join two strings together, we can use the ampersand symbol, but we won't just join them directly. They need to be separated by a backslash. So copy this variable name and time to assign it a value. So first up, we'll grab the folder path. And just as we do that, you will notice this line turns red. So let's deviate just a bit for a second. This is VBA's way of telling us that there is a syntax error. VBA is expecting something on the right hand side of this equal to sign, which we're actually just going to provide in a bit. However, if there is a red color statement in your code, we will not be able to execute the macro. Let's try that. Run the macro and we get a syntax error. Click OK. We see a yellow line out here. This means that the macro is in break mode. So it is still running. In order to exit out of this, let's press the stop button. Okay, back to our code. Let's grab the main folder path. We will attach a backslash at the end of this folder path. So ampersand. Backslash is a text value. So we need to enclose it inside double quotes. Backslash. And at the very end, we will add the import file name. Ampersand again and grab the import file variable. Let's check if you're getting the right value before we proceed. You know what to do out here. That's right, debug.print and we'll grab the full source name 
let's run this macro we can see the main folder path followed by a backslash followed by the import file name so this variable that we are creating by concatenating two different variables is populating correctly i'm happy with that let's delete this delete this and moving on next we'll be importing data into the data worksheet within columns a and e but since we'll be using this macro over and over again we need to clear previous data from these columns now columns is also an object and we can access the columns object pretty much the same way we access ranges so we are after the columns in the data worksheet dot choose the columns property and we want to delete the columns starting from a through to e if we want to select a continuous block of columns we can just go colon and e and this includes all the columns from a to e now this columns property is also an object and we need to do something with this what do we want to do we want to clear the contents so dot again and type clear contents intellisense is a bit weird sometimes for instance right now we press the dot and we did not get a list so out here we're kind of typing a bit blind the only way to be certain that clear contents is the right method of the columns object is to press enter and you can see this phrase gets capitalized you can see the c is capitalized and c is capitalized this is just vba's way of confirming that this is the right method of this object now let's save our file first come to our toolbar click save and let's run this macro go to our data worksheet we can see all the data in columns a to e has been cleared columns f g and h are just formulas and they still exist they just blank because there is no values in columns a to e and a bit of caution out here one thing to be aware of is that there is no way to undo this unless you exit the workbook and open it back up but then if you hadn't saved the macro before running it just like we did you could lose some unsaved code as well so as a best practice going forward we will save the workbook before running any macro now let's move on to opening the source file to open a file we'll use the open method of the workbooks object this little helper window at the bottom tells us that the open method takes in certain arguments at this stage we'll only provide the file name so what are we trying to open we're trying to open the source file name for which we have a variable out here so we'll use this variable directly copy close parenthesis and let's test this save the file run the macro and we can see that the july sales data file has opened the fact that our source file opened confirms that the folder path the file name and the full file name are all correct if your workbook doesn't open or there's an error please review all the file paths however once we open the file we need to start interacting with the worksheets and data ranges so the best way to open a workbook is to assign an object variable to it just as we open it that makes it easy to interact with the workbook once it's open so just above this line of code we will declare a workbook variable let's just call it wb and the data type is the workbook object and since this is an object variable we will set it and we will assign it this source file that we have just opened great let's save and run this we will get the same result as last time that is the july file will open up however what we are testing out here is whether the file opens through this variable declaration let's run this great the july file opened so it's working correctly up until now now our data is in sheet 1 this is one of our assumptions for this project the source data needs to be in sheet 1 within the source file what we are going to do now is identify this full range of data and copy it over to our data sheet within our template file first let's declare a range object variable to hold the range that we are about to copy so dim again we'll call the variable range to copy and it is a range object let's hop over back to excel for a bit if you want to select this entire data just using keyboards what would you do what we can do is select any cell within this data set and use the shortcut control a this will select the range of data that we want to copy over and we can do this exact same thing in vba the code that we will use to achieve this is called current region and it's a property of the range object 
So let's assign this current region to our range variable. Since range is an object, we need to use set. Copy this. We will follow the Excel object hierarchy. Now we're not in our current macro file. We want to refer to the source file, which is represented by this WB variable. And we're going to refer to sheet one. And in order to select the current region, we need to refer to a cell within that data range. But as normal practice, we normally refer to the first cell in that data range, which is cell A1. And now we can choose the current region property. Again, IntelliSense didn't show up. So let's press enter and we can see current region getting capitalized, which means that the statement is correct. Now, once the range is determined, we can copy it over in just one line of code. We will choose the copy method of our range object variable. So this is the range that we want to copy over dot and choose copy. And then we need to state the first cell of the area that we want to paste our data into. So where do we want to paste our data? We want to paste the data into the data worksheet of our current file and into columns A and E. But since we just need to provide the first cell, we will refer to range A1 in the data worksheet. This method uses the generic method to copy. That is when we use control C and control V, we will end up pasting everything, values, formatting, formulas, etc. Since we aren't worried about that at this stage, we can use this method. But say, if you want to copy just values and not formulas, then we would use the paste special method. But we will look at this in a different segment. For now, let's save our file and run this macro. So the July worksheet opened, come to our import template file, and we can see that the data has been populated into our data worksheet. Let's close this workbook and continue to our code. On a beginner level, I would suggest to keep testing your code as you move along. This will help catch any issues straight away. Instead of writing the full code, running it, finding an error, and then trying to figure out what part of the logic went wrong. Back to the code. Now that the data is successfully copied over, we can close the workbook. Close is a method of the workbook object. So we can go WP and choose the close method. And the little helper window has a couple of options. Since we are not making any changes to the source file name, we can set the save changes to false. Let's test this out. Save. Run. Data got copied over, but most importantly, but most importantly, the July workbook doesn't seem to be open. So this close method has worked well. Okay, we're not done yet. There is still one thing to take care of. Coming back to our data worksheet, we have formulas in column F onwards, which may not drag all the way down. For instance, consider this scenario. If we were doing this manually and the number of rows of data that we were pasting over is greater than the number of rows with formulas in them, then we would need to drag the formulas all the way down to the last row. There are a couple of ways to do this. You can select the last row of cells with formulas in them and drag them all the way down. Or you can select the last row with data, select the entire data range, make sure that we have the cells with formulas in them, select it as well, press Ctrl D and boom, the formulas get copied down. We will follow the second method and we can do this exact same thing in VBA and the method that we are going to use is called autofill. I hope that you're beginning to see a pattern out here. If we can do something in Excel, then we can definitely do it in VBA. Simple. Anything and everything is possible. Let's delete this off and go back to our code. We need to get the last row bit data. Let's dim a variable to hold the last row. We'll call it L row data. And since this is a row number, the data type can be a long. There are many ways to find the last row. The technique we're going to use here is that we will first determine the current region of our data set, just as we did above. And then we will count the number of rows in that current region. Easy. For more ways to find the last row, please check out my video link below. So let's assign the last row number to this variable. Copy, paste. So we're going to refer to the data worksheet and we are interested in the current region of the data. But for current region, we need to provide the reference to the first cell just as we did right out here.
Now what do you want to do with current region? We want to grab the rows. And what do you want to do with the rows? We want to count them. And that's the formula to find the last row. Let's first debug dot print and see whether it's giving us the right number. We get 29 and the last row is 29 as well. So it's giving us the right value. But let's just pause on this line of code for a bit. Up until now, we have only been looking at properties and methods for a range using the traditional object model that we discussed earlier. But this statement looks like a property of a property of a property. How is that possible? Now, the current region property returns a range of cells, which is an object. And an object can have properties and methods which we can access. So we can access its rows property, which also returns a range object. It is all the rows in that current region. And we can access its properties and methods as well, out of which we choose the count property. This may seem a bit convoluted, but let's try to work it back. So what do we want to do? We want to count the number of rows. But which rows are these? All the rows in the worksheet? No, we want the rows in the current region. But the current region of what? We can access the current region of a data range only by referencing a cell within that range. Normally, we start with the first cell in the range. And now, we need to tell VBA which worksheet are we trying to do all of this in? Well, it's the data worksheet. And that's how we come back to the same code. But this was only for explanation purposes. When constructing these statements, always start from left to right. Now that we have the last row, we will replicate the control D shortcut. We will select the top range with formulas in it, which is F2 to H2. And then we will select the equivalent of control D which is autofill. So let's first do that. So our range is going to go from F2 to H2. F2 colon H2 dot and we'll choose the autofill method. Space and the helper window down below tells us that we need to provide the destination. So here we will specify the full range of data that we want to copy the formulas into. And this range must include F2 to H2 as well. So this is the range that we're going to start the autofill from. And this is the range that we are going to perform the autofill over. So let's provide the destination range. It starts from F2 through to column H. And we need to provide the last row. For now, let's just hard code the value. The last row of our data set is row 29. Great. Let's run this, come back to our data worksheet and the formulas have populated all the way through to the last row. So the autofill method is working fine, but we have hard coded our values out here. What is the next data set? That is the data set for August has more than 29 rows. In fact, let's try that out now. We will change the import file to August and we have our August file right out here. Come back in, let's run a macro, come back to our data sheet. So this time around, we have 46 rows of data that came in from the August file. And you can see here that the formulas are still stuck at row 29. We need them to go all the way down. So how do we solve that? And that is exactly why we have determined the last row variable out here. So what we're gonna do is delete this and concatenate the last row number to this range. So this way, no matter how big the data set is, we will always capture the right size of the data. This makes our formula truly dynamic. Okay, let's run this and see if it works. Come back to our data worksheet. And this time the formulas have dragged all the way right down to the last row, which is row number 46. Okay. I'm going to run this one more time and this time I'm going to ask you to just observe how the screen moves. Let's hit play. And we could see the screen flutter slightly. That's VBA interacting with Excel and performing all the actions that we have told it to do. But we can add a bit more finesse to this. Let's stop the screen from updating. For that, we need to add two lines of code. Right at the top, 
at the very start of the code, we will turn off screen updating. Application dot screen updating and set this to false. This setting is at the Excel application level and we are overriding this setting just for our macro. And what we want is for Excel to revert back to its normal state once we are done with the macro. So we will turn it back on at the end of the code. Copy this, come all the way down, paste it and change this to true. Let's run this and see if there was any effect. That was a much more stable run. Application.screen updating is a very handy tool to have. It makes your macro look a bit professional and also increases the overall speed of the macro processing. Almost there now. We will be running this macro from our Excel sheet. So we need some way to alert us that the macro has completed running and the data has been copied over. We can do this via message box. So right before the application.screen updating line, we'll add in a message box. And the message can just say import complete. Let's save this and run. Great. Click OK. And that's how to copy and paste in data from an external workbook. Let's go back to Excel. For the final part, let's add in a button onto our Excel sheet, which we can use to trigger the macro. Starting from our console sheet, let's go to the developer tab, insert, form controls, and choose the first icon, which is the button. Click it. We can see that our mouse cursor turns into a plus sign. Click down and drag your mouse to the right to create a rectangle. The exact shape doesn't really matter. We can always resize it afterwards. And we can select the macro that we want to assign to this button. Click OK. Right click. We'll edit the text. We'll rename this button to import data. Click outside. Save the file. And let's run it one last time. And just for confirmation, I'm just going to delete this data. Come back to our console sheet. Run the macro by pressing the button. We get a confirmation message box. Click OK. Go to the data sheet and the data has been pasted over. Fantastic. And that's it. We have completed building the first of our macros. And once we import this data, you as the analyst, we wish to manually inspect the data, making sure whether the sales numbers look OK and there's no mistake. We are not really looking for a mistake in the macro logic. Rather, we could just sense check that the report looks OK before sending it to our bosses. And this is another advantage of running the macro in separate steps. OK, these tables look fine to me. We can now proceed to the next step of saving a copy of this report with just the table and data worksheets and minus all the formulas. The objective of this macro is to copy all the data from our analysis tab and the data tab into a new Excel file and save it with the file name as given in cell G3 on the console worksheet. Both the data and analysis worksheets have formulas linking to other sheets that we are not copying over. So we will need to make sure that we do not copy over the formulas. What would happen if we forgot to eliminate the formulas? In that case, the formulas in the new report copy would link back to our original template file. And the person who opens this new copy will get a message saying that the file contains external links and whether they want to update it. And that just doesn't look professional. So we will avoid all formulas. Okay, I'm going to speed up the parts of the code that I've already covered in macro one and just pause over the new bits. Let's head on over to our VB editor, Alt F11. We will create a new module, right click, insert, module, come down to the properties window. We will rename this, we can call it create copy. Come to our coding window, create a new sub. We'll call it create copy of report. Hit enter. We will start off by turning off the screen updating at the start and turning it back on at the end. Just gonna copy the code from the previous macro. Paste, paste, turn this to true, add some space in between. We're going to work with three worksheets, data, analysis, and console. Let's assign variables for them. And again, I'm going to cheat a bit, come back, copy this code, paste it here. So we've already assigned variables for the console and data worksheet. Let's add a variable for the analysis worksheet. G3 
change this to analysis change this to analysis as well the file name that we want to save the report copy is given in the console sheet in cell g3 and the folder path is in g1 let's do what we did in the previous macro we can join these two together to give us the full file path of the file that we want to save as so we'll declare variables for the main folder path the report file name and the full file name that we are going to concatenate using the main folder and the report file name we will assign the value in g1 to the main folder variable and the value in g3 to the report file name and now it's time to join these two together separated by a backslash so copy the file copy name is equal to starts with the main folder path ampersand to concatenate double quotes add in the backslash ampersand and the report file name i am rushing through this but let's not get ahead of cells what we'll do is just debug.print this file copy name just to make sure that we are on the right track so far so debug.print and the file copy name save our excel file run the macro Okay, so that is our correct folder path. We have our backslash and that is the correct file name that we want to save the report copy as. Awesome. Delete this, delete this. Now to the new part. This time we will open a new Excel file and paste data into it. To open a new workbook, we can use the add method of the workbooks object. Let's try that out. Save the file. Let's run this and a blank Excel template has opened up. Awesome. But we want to be able to interact with this new Excel file once it's open. So we will do the same thing that we did in the previous macro. That is create a new workbook variable and assign the workbook variable to the new workbook that we open up. So declare a new workbook variable. And since it's a workbook object, we will use set WB equals to the new workbook. Now let's head on over to Excel to understand what we are about to do next. Let's open a blank Excel workbook. When a new Excel file is created, it opens with the default worksheet called sheet one. What we are going to do is add two more worksheets here and call them data and analysis and paste our data into them and then delete off sheet one. Let's close this, go back to our VB editor. So first we will add a new worksheet following the Excel object hierarchy. We will refer to the workbook dot and choose the add method of the sheets object brackets and this is going to add a new sheet and here we can specify whether we want to add it before or after a certain worksheet so what we want to do is we want to add a new worksheet after the worksheet called sheet one so after wb and sheet one but if you just try and add a new worksheet, that worksheet will get created with the worksheet name sheet two. What we can do instead is set the name of this worksheet to data. So we will alter the name property of the new worksheet that we are about to create. And we call it data. Let's save this and run this to see if it's working. A new workbook has opened and the worksheet called data has been created after the worksheet sheet one. Close this file. Now let's copy the current region of data from the data sheet in our original template. So the current region is control A. We're going to select everything from A to H right down to the last row. So let's refer to the data worksheet. To select a current region, we first need to refer to the first cell in that current region. And current region, as we saw in the last macro, is an object as well. And what do you want to do with this current region? We want to copy it. Now, unlike last time, if we use the regular paste method and feed in the first cell of where we want to copy the data to, it will paste everything, including the formulas, but we don't want to copy the formulas. So we will do the same thing that we would do in Excel. If faced with this issue, we will use paste special. And if using paste special, we want to do the pasting in a new line of code. The paste special method has many options. Let's head on over to Excel. Let's randomly copy some data, control C and attempt to paste it somewhere. But when pasting it, let's right click in the cell and choose the paste special, the paste special option. We have so many options to choose from. Which option would you use if you wanted to copy over the values, the number format and all the formatting as well. Looks like we will need to do paste special twice. 
once with values and number formats and another page special with just the formats. And guess what? We can do the exact same thing in VBA. Head back to our code. So we need to specify the first cell in the range where we want to paste this data into. So where do we want to paste this data? We want to paste this data into the data worksheet of the newly opened workbook in the range starting from cell A1. Let's refer to it using the Excel object model hierarchy. Sheets, choose data, range A1 dot. And this time we're going to choose the paste special method. The IntelliSense is not working again. So let's cheat a bit out here. Just going to go range one dot paste special, give a space. And now because the IntelliSense came, we can see all the options that we saw in Excel as well. So which one do we want to choose? We're going to do this twice. So in the first paste special, we're going to choose values and number formats. Let's do that. So I'm going to take this add it up here and for the next line space to get the options we're just going to paste the formats great copy this option paste it here and we will delete off this line okay let's save and run this macro and see if it works run the macro so we have a new data worksheet that's popular after sheet one and all our columns have been pasted here. But most importantly, the formulas haven't pasted over. Great. Let's close this. So up here, we're referring to this data worksheet twice. One way to avoid this or to shorten this code would be to assign and use a variable. Another way to perform multiple activities with the same object is to use the with statement. So let's see how to do that. So enter, we will select the reference to data worksheet in the new workbook. Control X, delete this off, and let's write a with statement. With the data worksheet in the new workbook, we want to paste special the values and number formats and paste special just the formats. And if we start a with statement, we need to close it as well using end with. And generally, if you're writing lines of code inside another line of code, we will change the indenting of these inside lines. So select both and press tab once. This is a best practice way of writing code and it indicates that these lines are a part of the with statement. Now moving on, let's copy the table from the analysis sheet as well. First, add in a new sheet. We will do the exact same thing that we did out here. So we're gonna add a new worksheet after sheet one in the new workbook and we're gonna call it analysis. Copy this, paste this and change this to analysis. Now let's go to our Excel worksheet, analysis tab. Our data range is sitting in cells B2 through to range P11. But we can't just select B2 and use its current region. That's because current region only works with continuous data. But row 3 is blank, so we can't use current region. And let's just confirm that. I'm going to select cell B2, press Ctrl A, only B2 and C2 get selected. But the rest of the data isn't selected. What we will do is specify the actual range out here. So from B2 to P11 within the code by providing fixed cell references. Come back to our code. So in the analysis worksheet, we will select the range B2 through to P11 and we will copy it. This is called hard coding. We have submitted the actual range. Up until now, we have been doing dynamic coding where our values are just based on the data set. Example, when we copied from the data worksheet, we used current region to determine what the data range is and didn't go like cell A1 to Q4. So no matter how big or small the sales number data set is in each month, our code will adjust and recognize the data range. But in this case, we are hard coding the range. The risk is that tomorrow, if we restructure our table, then our code will be pointing to the incorrect range and we need to update this hard coded cell reference. But our assumption here is that the table won't be changing. Our bosses like to see the same format every month. So we could get away with hard coding just in this instance. Moving on, let's paste data from the original analysis tab over to this worksheet. We will do the same thing out here. This time 
we're going to paste in the analysis worksheet in the new workbook and the starting cell b2 and that's it save and one more thing let's delete off sheet one and again following the excel object model hierarchy workbook dot sheets sheet one dot to delete this worksheet permanently we will use the delete method let's save and run this macro we're getting a message from excel asking us to confirm that we want to permanently delete this sheet yes we want to continue okay let's see what got populated a new workbook has opened there is no sheet one data in our analysis tab has been copied over and it has no formulas and the data worksheet has been copied over as well awesome let's close this don't save now we need to save this new workbook with the report copy name that we had created by joining cells g1 and g3 in the console worksheet so we want to save as let's refer to the workbook dot and we will save as because we want to assign it a file name and we provide the file name which is nothing but the variable out here and we will provide the file format as well the file format for a dot xlsx workbook is represented by this property and finally let's close the workbook wb dot choose the close method and we won't save any changes because we already saved the file above Okay, let's save this and let's run the file. We get a message confirming whether we want to delete the worksheet. We need to do something about this. For now, we'll select delete. Okay, before we address the message, let's confirm whether we've saved the file in a folder or not. So go back to our folder and we can see that this current month file has been populated. Let's open it. And it has just the data and the analysis tabs and all the data seems to have been copied over. Awesome. Okay, so this is the first time that we have saved this data file out here. Let's run this macro one more time. We get the same message as previous. Yes, we want to delete. And now we get another message saying that there is already a file called current month file which exists in the location and Excel is asking us whether we want to replace this. And obviously we want to replace it, so we'll select yes. Now, we need to do something with those messages because having to click messages inside a macro just does not look nice. So we have one trick for this. Similar to the screen updating, we can tell Excel to turn off all the alerts at the start of the macro and turn it back on at the end. So let's come up here and again say application dot display alerts and we turn this to false. Come back down and turn this on just before we exit the macro. Let's save this and run the macro. Well, this time everything ran a smooth run and we weren't asked those two messages. And let's just check the file. Yes, a new file did get created and I can tell this by the timestamp out here. And for a final touch, let's add a confirmation message box just the same way we did in the last macro. And we just say copy. Great. And that was how to copy data from an existing file and paste it into a new file. Let's head on over to Excel, onto our console sheet, and let's create a new button for it. Go to developer tab, insert, form controls and button, come down, drag and create a rectangle. This time choose the new macro that we have just created. OK. And we'll rename this to create copy. Let's save this. And just for the sake of satisfaction, let's run this macro one last time. And we get a confirmation message. Click OK. Awesome. And that's a second macro. And let's move on to our third macro for this segment where we'll send the copy to our team via Outlook. The objective of this macro is to email a copy of our saved report template file to our mailing list, which can be found in the email list worksheet. Let's go to the BB editor, create a new module, right click insert module. We'll rename it to send email, create a new sub, 
we'll call it send email. As always, let's add the screen updating lines to stop our screen from fluttering. We'll be using the worksheets console, email list, and analysis. Let's assign variables for these worksheets. I'm just gonna copy and paste the data out here. So these are three worksheet variables. And here we are assigning each worksheet to them using set. Now we're gonna capture all the email IDs from cell A2 to the last cell in column A. This is another example of dynamic coding. To find the last cell, we need the last row, which is the number of rows in that current region. Let's dim a variable to hold the number of rows and assign it to the count of rows in that current region. We've already covered this code in the first macro. So we're gonna move on to the next part. All the email IDs will go into the to field of the Outlook email, and this is how the final string is gonna look. So email IDs separated by a semicolon. So what we're gonna do is loop over the column grab the first email ID, attach a semicolon to it, and then go to the next row, grab the email ID, and so on. So basically, we will end up populating a giant string of email IDs. So we need a string variable to hold it. Let's dim one now. Since we are in the testing phase, I will highly recommend to be extra cautious when building code for sending out emails. I will suggest that you use your own email ID in all the rows in this column. You can change it back once you have built this entire macro. That way, even if you accidentally send an email, it will only go to you. And another point, we will not be sending the final email. We will just bring up the email and the analyst will need to push send. This is to err on the side of caution. Nowhere in the code am I going to mention how to directly send the email. So don't worry about the code. Nothing can go wrong. Worst case is that you will land up displaying a gibberish email, which you can then delete off. Okay, back to our loop. We will use a for loop to hop over each email ID. A for loop will return increments of one from a starting number to an ending number, both of which you need to specify. So we need to specify the starting row and the ending row of the loop, and then we need a counter or an iteration variable which tells us which row of the loop we are currently in. So let's declare a counter variable, which is just a number, so it can be a long. Now for the loop. So we will go for i, which is the counter variable, starting from the second row to the last row, which is the last row out here. And I've just noticed a slight mistake. We need to change this to EM. And that's another example why you should be copying and pasting variables instead of writing out the variable names from scratch. Looks like I broke my own rule. Anyways, back to the loop. This tells us to start the counter from two, moving on to three through to the last row, which in this case is four. Row one is the column header and we can skip over it by starting directly from row number two. Every loop in VBA needs to be closed. We can close this loop by going next and I. So here we have a loop that will go two, three, and four. We can do whatever we want with that information. For the sake of example, let's just print the numbers. So the actual number is the variable I. Inside of a for loop, we can debug print the statement. Now, we won't just run the complete macro but let's step through it and understand how the code plays out. So with the cursor inside the macro, hit F8. You see this yellow bar on the top row of the macro? That indicates which line of code is about to be executed. Hit F8 again and again till you come to the for loop. Now hit F8 again. The loop has been initialized. Hit F8 and come to the next statement. In the image at window, we can see the value too. So this is the first iteration of the loop. So in the first iteration of the loop, the value of i was two. Now hit F8 again and again. This time three was printed out and F8 again and again. And this time we have four and one more final time. And we have exited out of the for loop and we can run the remaining macro. 
So you can see that the macro didn't just print out two, three, four in one go. Rather, we went through three loops and each loop gave us a number from the lowest to the highest. Great. How do we use this now? Let's uh, debug.print the value of each cell. So instead of I, we can go the worksheet, select range, the values are in column A. So traditionally, we can refer to these cells as A2, A3, and A4. But here, we will derive the values 2, 3, and 4 from the loop itself using the I counter variable. So close the double quotes and we'll join the I variable to the column A to make up the current range. So this is the current range or the current cell. And what do we want to print out? We want to print out its value. Okay, let's save and run this macro. We can see each email ID got printed out. Fantastic. Delete this off. For the email ID, we want to populate all the email IDs within the same string separated by a semicolon. We can use our two variable for this. So instead of printing it out, we can assign this value to the two variable. In the first loop, S2 will get populated with the first email ID. And in the second loop, we want to join the email ID from the previous loop to the email ID in the current row. We can do this by joining the S2 variable in front of the sale value. So we will go S2 and join it to the cell value using the ampersand symbol. Each email ID needs to be separated by a semicolon. Let's join that at the end. And we will debug.print the S2 variable in each iteration of the loop. Okay, this may seem a bit complicated. The best way to understand what's happening is to step through the code. Let's do that. Let's F8 all the way through the loop. So before we start, S2 will be blank and you can confirm this by hovering over the variable and you can see that it's basically a blank string. This hovering technique is a shortcut for checking values of any variables. So in the first loop, we're joining a blank string to the first email ID in the current cell joined to a semicolon. Let's F8, F8 once more, and that's what we get in our image window. F8 again, this time, let's again hover over the S2 variable. This is the previous email ID along with the semicolon. And we're going to join it to the next email ID in the current row, which is analyst 2. So before we print this variable out, let's just clear our image at window so that there's no confusion. F8 once more. And now you can see the next iteration of the loop has joined both the email IDs with the semicolon. Delete this off. And in the final iteration of the loop, we get the complete email string, each separated by a semicolon. Let's complete out of the macro. I was proofing this video and thought of adding some extra explanation to cement our understanding of the for loop, which we're using to create our email string. Let's try and do the same thing in Excel. Come to our email list sheet. Let's copy this to the side. Now, Suppose we want to join all of these together, separating each with a semicolon. How could we do this in Excel? We can write a progression of formulas. Let's start with the first cell. The formula here would be the value from the previous row, which is E1, joined to the current value from the email list, which is D2, joined to a semicolon. The previous row is blank, so the first result will be just the current row value from the email list and the semicolon. Now, let's drag these formulas all the way down. The last cell here will be our final string with all the emails joined together. In this formula, the top row holds the results from the previous formula. In a sense, the top row in our formula is the same as the S2 string variable that we populate out here. And we can't get the giant email string in one go. We need to construct our formula and apply it against each row, starting from the first row through to the last row. Does this remind you of something? Yes, it's exactly what a for loop is doing. In Excel, it is our hand which is dragging down the formulas. 
in VBA, it is the for loop which increments the counter variable which allows us to go from the top row to the bottom row. I hope this Excel scenario offers a clearer explanation for the for loop. Okay, back to the video. So this looks good, but we can see here that there is an extra semicolon at the very end of the string. We don't need this. So how do we remove this? Well, the answer is in Excel. Let's copy this. Go to some sheet in Excel, paste this. Now, if you want to remove the last character from a text string, how do you do this? Our code for this would be equals to left of this particular cell and how many characters left of this cell do we want? Well, we want it to be the length of the entire cell minus one. Mm, let me cut this and just paste this below so that it's a bit clear. Okay, so this is the formula and here we can see that there is no semicolon at the very end. And we can use this exact same formula in VBA, but instead of cell, we'll replace it with a final string variable. So I'm going to copy this formula, head back to VB, paste the formula here. So instead of G6, we can replace it with our two variable. And we need to assign this to something. And what can we assign it to? Well, we can assign it to the same variable itself. So now the two variable is going to get overridden by the result of this formula. Okay, let's delete the image at window. Okay, let's cut this and paste it below here because we want to print the final value after the formula. Let's run this. And this time we can see that the two variable does not have the semicolon at the very end. Awesome. Now moving on, let's grab a file name and folder path from the console sheet and join them together. This will give us the full file name of the report copy that we want to attach to the email. This is basically the same code as here. So we just copy this and paste it below. We're going to grab the full file path of the report copy so that we can attach it to the email that we are about to send out. And now let's also grab the reporting month from the analysis worksheet. So this right here, we'll be adding some cool customization in our email message. So this is cell C2 in the analysis worksheet. We will dim a string variable first and assign the value of cell C2 in the analysis worksheet to it. Okay. And now for the main part of the segment, how to send an email using Outlook through Excel VBA. This is a three step process. And to get some support on this, let's head over to my blog site skillsinautomation.com in the search bar let's type basic email and we'll go to this blog post right here full link will be in the description below and feel free to watch this video later i am almost tempted to play it here because it explains exactly what we are about to do but i fear it might become a bit too inception like a video of a video inside this video instead we can just go through the steps out here. So back to our three steps. In Excel VBA, to send an email via Outlook and to access the various features of Outlook, we need to create a reference to the Outlook object library. So come to our VB editor, go to tools, references. Let's scroll down till we see Microsoft and then scroll a bit further till we see Microsoft and Outlook. There, my version is 16, yours might be different, doesn't really matter. Tick this, click OK. And now step two. This step is split into two parts. First, we will connect to the Outlook application, which is the parent object. And through that parent object, we will connect to the Outlook email object. And we won't just connect to it. We'll create a new instance of it. This is the same as opening Outlook and then through it, creating new email. So we can just copy this code right here. Well, this is actually how you would proceed after this project. If you want to learn something new, just Google it. You will end up on a page like this. First, understand what the code is doing. Don't copy code randomly and hope that it'll work. But if you trust the code, copy it and paste it into your sub procedure and just tweak the necessary parts. So copy the object variable declaration and assignment for the Outlook application. Control C, let me paste it here. This apostrophe here is called a comment. 
anything we type after it will be ignored by the macro which will proceed to run the next line after it. We can use comments to make notes to ourselves explaining what a piece of code is doing. And next we'll copy the object variable assignment and declaration for the email object. And that's our email object which is nothing but a blank template. And now we have full access to its methods and properties. To test this, let's display a blank email template. Dot and we'll use the display method. Let's save and run this macro. Awesome. I hope that worked for everyone. If it didn't, please replay the steps or visit this blog page and follow the instructions out here. Let's delete this line. Now, let's create a variable to hold the email body and another one to hold the subject. Both are text, so they will be string data type. First, the subject. We will just create a generic subject and call it month end sales report. Next, we will add the body text, which is a bit more complicated. So let's kind of write out what we want the body to look like. These are three separate lines, but we can still store them in the same variable. First of all, VBA is not going to read this as three lines. So to VBA, this actually looks like this. Now this email is going to be in HTML format, which will be the most common format we use in an office environment. In HTML, to move to the next line, we need to use a break tag. So first of all, let's wrap this entire text inside double quotes because all text needs to go inside double quotes. Okay. Now, if I want to tell the email object to create a new line after high all comma, we need to use the HTML break tag br and this will take it to another line. And we can do the same thing after August full stop. Add a break tag here as well. And let's assign this to our S body variable. But this doesn't look too good in our code itself. So let's give this a bit of a structure. We will put this on separate lines inside our code. In order to do that, we need to end our double quote ampersand to join this text to the next line of text. And to move this line on a different line in our VBA code, we will use the underscore symbol. Great. Same thing here, double quotes, come to the end, close double quotes, ampersand, underscore, enter to a new line and double quotes. Okay, almost there. Now we have put in August out here, but the next month won't be August. And we don't want to update our code each month just to change the email body. Instead, we can insert a variable which holds the current month. And we have already created this variable right here. So let's insert it into our line of text. Control C, we'll delete this off, end our double quotes, ampersand, join the text on the left to our report month variable, and ampersand again to join it to the next part of the text. and this part of the text needs a double quote as well. And that's it. Awesome. All that's left now is step three of creating the Outlook email in Excel VBA. And that is to fill in the email template. So let's head back to my blog post. So let's go through this code. These are just the essential properties and methods of the email object. And if you're filling multiple properties or methods of the same object, we can use the with statement as we had done so in the previous macro. Let's copy and paste it into our code out here. Let's go through each line. The first line is our email to. We can replace it with our to variable that we had created above. The CC and the PCC will leave it as blank. We'll replace the subject with our subject variable. We will replace the body with a body variable. Add our attachment in front of the attachments method. So let's uncomment this out and add our attachment file, which is nothing but this variable right here. And this send line is commented out, which means that VBA is going to ignore this since this is a beginner course. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to include the send code anywhere inside our macro. 
So we'll delete it. This way, the worst, worst that will happen is that even if you make a mistake, you will generate a gibberish email that will just get displayed and then you can just delete it off. No harm done, nobody gets sent anything. And we will leave the display method as is. And that's it, that's the full macro. Let's save this file and run the macro. Wow, that ran perfectly. Let's inspect this email. R2 has been populated by all the three email IDs. We have our subject and our body as well. We can see that the month August has been dynamically inserted into our text and all three statements are on different lines, just the way we wanted. And last but not least, our attachment has been added as well. Come to the console worksheet in the developer tab, insert form controls, drag out the button, choose the send email procedure that we just created, click OK, edit the text, change it to send email, and let's hit send. Great, everything seems to be working fine. This was probably the most challenging macro of the lot. Replay this segment if you haven't understood any part. Feel free to ask in the comments. I also have multiple videos on sending emails, including a tutorial series. Please check those out as well. Next, we will pause just for a bit to inspect our full macro in its entirety. We have created three separate macros, which together make up the end-to-end -end process. And let's run it together. In this segment, we will test all three macros together. Well, we've already tested them and there were no errors, but let's just go through the full process once. So first, we import data. The import is complete. If you want, we can go to the data or the analysis worksheet and just check if all the values are populating correctly. Next, create a copy. Okay, and a file gets created which is the correct file because it's carrying the right date stamp from just now. And finally, let's send the email. And if the analyst is happy with this email, they can just click the send button. And that's the full process. If you have successfully completed the course up until here, congratulations. We started from very little knowledge about VBA to automating a full process. You may very well exit the video right here and use these macros as is, but I will recommend that we add some checks to make sure that our macro doesn't break due to bad data. And let's check for those next. Welcome to the bonus section. Let's recap what we've done so far. We have an existing macro file, which imports data from a source file, places it into our data worksheet, saves a copy of this template file and emails it to the users. The user of this macro is expected to input the main folder path in cell G1 in a console worksheet. This will host the source file, our macro file, and the report copy that we are about to save. The name of the source file is in G2, and the name of the copy or the destination file is in G3. We haven't checked if any of this user input data or the data that we are importing into our data worksheet is valid or not. This is what we are about to do now. First, we will save our current macro workbook with a different name. That way, you'll have a copy of the three-step version that we built in the previous segment. Let's call this file error handling and save. Next, we will create a new worksheet and call it header check. Here, we will paste our column headers from the data worksheet, specifically only the ones that we want to import data into, that is, the column headers from A to E. Let's copy, control C, and paste it in cell A1. But we'll transpose the values as we paste them. We will use this sheet later on to cross check whether the data that we're importing from the source file has the same column headers as what we're expecting here. If there is a mismatch, our formulas in column F onwards would error out since they're dependent on this data. In that case, we wouldn't go ahead and import the data. First, let's come to our console worksheet. We will add a new field note here. You can call this data column count. The value that we're going to input here is five, which is the count of columns from A to E in the data worksheet. Now, let's head on over to our VB editor, Alt F11. Create a new module, 
right click insert module rename this call it error handling let's create a new sub call this error handling add in our screen updating lines to prevent the screen from fluttering we will be using the console worksheet data worksheet and the header worksheet in this macro let's declare and assign variables to them i'm just going to copy and paste this data in because we have already seen how to do this and let's declare and assign variables for each value in column G in the console worksheet. I'm going to paste in these values as well. So we're declaring a variable for the newly added data count as well. One thing to note here is that we've declared this value as a long because we're expecting a number out here. For the very first error handler, we will check whether each field in column G has a value in it or not. We will use an if statement for this. Let's test for one value and then we'll add in the rest. So we're going to create a first if statement. An if statement allows for us to check whether a condition or logic is valid or not. If the condition is met, then the if statement gets triggered and we can prompt VBA to do something. And if the condition isn't met, then the if statement remains untriggered, it is ignored and the code moves to the next line. So to start an if statement, we will type in if and then the condition out here we're going to check if the value in cell g1 is blank so that is our condition let's type it out the value in cell g1 is represented by this variable so if this string variable is blank then we will do something about it so after we write the condition for an if statement we need to end that particular line with a then enter before we proceed with the logic, let's close this if statement first. So end if. Now once the code comes out here, VBA will check whether this condition is true or not. If it is, that is, if the value in cell G1 is blank, then we will get VBA to do something. And what should we do? For starters, we will just print that an error has occurred into our immediate window. Okay, so now that we are in a testing phase, what we will do is blank out this value, delete, and test if our if statement is working or not. Let's step through this code, but we will do this slightly differently. Instead of just hitting F8, get your cursor to the left into this gray column and just click down. You can see a maroon dot, and that particular line against which we click down turns maroon as well. This is called a breakpoint. So now what we can do we can keep our cursor inside the sub procedure and hit play and the macro and all these lines before the maroon line will get executed and the macro will come and stop at this particular line. And once it does, we can just F8 and step through each line one by one. This saves us some time of having to F8 through each and every line. This is a really helpful trick, especially if you have a lot of lines of code. Okay, keep your cursor in the sub procedure and hit play. So our code has come and stopped at this if statement, but it's not yet been executed. Now, we had blanked out the value in cell G1. So the main folder variable should be empty or rather it should be a blank string. We can confirm that by hovering our cursor over the main folder variable. The little helper window below the main folder says that the value is currently blank. So this condition should actually hold true and we should be able to step down into this next line. Let's check that out. Great. So this condition was met and the if statement got triggered. Let's F8 again. We get a value printed into the image window. Let's F8 again. We exit out of the if statement and let's play out the macro. Now conversely, if you want to check if the main folder value is not blank, the symbols for that is a less than and greater to sign. So G1 is still blank, which means that this condition will not be met. The if statement should not be triggered and this value should not be printed. Let's delete this. Get a cursor to the left of the if statement. Click down and then let's play the macro. Okay, let's F8 now and see what happens. So the condition was not met and the macro jumps to the end if statement. If we go F8 and that's it, a macro plays out. Okay, 
there are many variations of the if statement that you can play around with. Let's change this back to equal to one last variation before we return to our project. In this particular case, if the condition is not met, then we just exit out of the if statement. But we can also do something if the condition is not met. That is, let's press enter. If this is true, we will print error occurred. Otherwise or else. We can print no error. So I've filled in the value in cell G1 back again. So in this case, this condition should not be met. This statement will get jumped over. The else of the if statement will get triggered and the macro should print out no error. Let's see that in action. Again, come to the left of the if statement and click play the macro and let's F8 one by one. As expected, this statement gets jumped over. The else condition is triggered and we get the value no error and we exit out of the if statement. And that's your basic if statements. Let's delete this and return back to our project. So we want to check if each value in G1, G2, G3 and G4 is blank or not. And we can do that within the same if statement. If we want to check for either one condition or another condition, we can add in the second condition using or. Now we'll check whether import file is blank. Now double quotes is for a text value. So when we have double quotes with nothing in it, we are checking for a blank string. But data column count has been declared as a long variable. And a long variable will hold a blank value as a zero. Okay. Let's come here. I'm just gonna paste this out, delete this, save the file. So at least one of the cells is blank. Let's run this macro and see if this print statement gets triggered. Awesome. But realistically, instead of printing out an error, we would rather want to display an error message so the user is alerted. So we'll delete this out and place in a message box instead. Now, we are going to run many tests in this macro. This is just the first. So if this fails, we do not want to continue with the rest of the code and we should exit this sub procedure. And the code to exit a sub is exit sub. But as a rule, we need to return Excel to its original settings before we enter some procedure. So let's copy this statement and paste it here so that the screen updating is turned back to true before the sub procedure ends. Okay, we've already tested whether this if statement is working or not. But now we're checking if any of these conditions is met, then we get a message box and the sub procedure exits out at this particular line. So to test that, let's debug.print. It's gonna write random. This doesn't really matter. What does matter is that we know the report file name is blank. When we run the sub procedure, all these three statements should get triggered and we should exit out the sub without the macro moving on to the next line of code. So if this prints out, then something is wrong. Okay, let's test this out. We get a message box and nothing got printed out in the immediate window. So all of this is working fine. Moving on to our next check. Sorry. First, let's copy and paste this back in. Delete this off. Moving on to our next check. We will now check if this source file exists or not. If it doesn't exist, it will mean that either the file path is incorrect or the file name is incorrect. Let's create a string variable to hold the full file path. We've already done this in the very first macro. Actually, before we do that, let's add in some comments. So just before this check, I'm gonna put in check one. So this comment just tells us what we're actually doing out here. Similarly, let's add in a comment for our check two. Back to our project, we're gonna declare a string variable to hold the full file path. And for the value that we'll assign to it, we will concatenate 
the main folder to the import file separated by a backslash. To check if the file exists, we will use the dir function. Functions in VBA are similar to functions in Excel, that is, they return a value. dir function will take a parameter which is the full file path. If it can't find the file, it will return a blank string. So our if statement should be if and the condition dir requires the path name which is our full file path. If it can't find the file, then it will return an empty string. So that is our condition. Put in our then. Close the if. And if this file name is incorrect, then similar to check one, we'll put another message box, turn the screen updating back to true and exit the sub. So August 2021 does exist. But what we will do is change this to August 2022. This file does not exist. Let's run this macro. If we get a message saying that the import file doesn't exist, that means the if statement has triggered and this logic is working correctly. So let's check for that. Play. Import file doesn't exist. Please check. It's correct. Let's turn this back. In just to be on the safe side, we should check if this doesn't get triggered. That is, if this dir function is actually working correctly, which means if it's actually recognizing the full source file name. So we've changed the file name back to its original value. And let's run this. If you do not get any message box, then this function is also working correctly. Hmm. The macro ran. We didn't get any message box. Awesome. Moving on. Next. We will check if the extension of the file copy is .xlsx. So when the user of this file inputs the file name that they want to save the report as, they need to provide an extension and the extension should be .xlsx. So we're going to use the if statement again. I'm just going to paste the if statement as is. This part is the same what we're doing above. A unique message box, turn the screen updating back to true and exit the sub. So let's have a look at this particular statement. What are we checking out here? We are checking whether the last five characters of the report file name variable is .xlsx or not. If it isn't, then the statement will get triggered. Coming back to Excel, this is the exact same as saying is equal to if right of this value, feed in the number of characters, so if this doesn't, so this is our condition or the logical test. So if the right of this value is not the correct extension, then error. Otherwise, do nothing. So we do nothing. Error. And that's basically it. Let's test if this works or not. First, let's test it as is. We should not get any error because the extension was entered correctly. Play. Hmm. Oh, I filled in a capital X at the end by mistake. So the condition actually got triggered because that's not what it was expecting. It is case sensitive. So, okay. What we need to do is change this back. This is the correct extension. Let's run this. Now we should not get any message. The macro ran without anything getting triggered. Awesome. Moving on. For the rest of the checks, we need to open the source file. We're going to check whether the data columns match, whether there is data or not, etc. Let's open the source file by assigning an object to the workbook as we open it. We have done this already before. Let's dim a workbook variable and set it to the workbook that we are about to open, which is the source file. Let's also capture the current region of the source data and dump it into a range object. The current region is the same as control A to select the entire data range. And our data set is in sheet one. Just as a refresher, this is our source data, control A, and this is the range that we are about to assign to a range variable. Back to our code, dim a range variable. 
set it following the Excel object model hierarchy. Workbook, sheets, our data is in sheet one. We need to refer to the first cell in the range in order to get the current region. Dot current region. Now we will verify whether there is data in this sheet or not. We will assume that the first row will be headers. So we will check whether this data set has more than one row. The way to do this is check whether the count of rows in the current region is less than or equal to one. One variation from the previous error handlers is that if this condition is met, we need to close the workbook that we have just opened before we exit the sub. Let's write out our condition. If the count of rows in our range, so first the range variable, rows, and what do we want from this rows object? We want to know its count. And if the count is less than or equal to one, then close the if statement, put in our message box, close the source file without saving any changes, turn screen updating back on and exit the sub. Great. Let's test and see if this works. So let's run it as is. The macro should run without anything getting triggered because there is data in our source file. It ran. Well, it ran, but our source file is opened. What we will do is jump ahead a bit and, and close this workbook before we exit the sub. Because if this check has passed, we need to make sure that the source file that we've opened is closed back. And let's display a message that this procedure ran successfully. Save the file, run this again. And we get a success message saying that no errors are found. Awesome. So what we will do now is open the August file, delete all the data leaving in the headers. Even if we delete the header, it will still throw an error. So save, come back to our code. Let's run this now. We get a message saying that there's no data in the source file. So that is correct. Okay. And the next test is whether the source file was closed or not. I can't see it open, which means it's definitely closed. So great. This check is working fine. Moving on. Our next test will involve the value in cell G4 in the console worksheet. This is the number of columns of data we expect to paste in the data worksheet. We don't want the number of columns in the source data to be less than this value. In that case, our formulas won't work. But worse yet, we definitely don't want the number of columns to be more than this value because then the imported data will trickle into our formula columns and the formulas will get overridden and we most certainly don't want that. This is the variable that captures the value in cell G4. In the previous check, we counted the number of rows in the source data. For this particular check, we can count the number of columns in the source range. So our condition will be if the range object will refer to the columns and the count and in the number of columns. So we want to check if it's less than or greater than the value in cell G4. So we'll use the less than in the greater than symbols and we'll bring in our data column count variable. That's a condition. Then close the if statement and we'll do the same things we did up here. A message box, close the source file, turn the screen updating back on and exit the sub. And we've made the message in the message box dynamic. That is, instead of just seeing the number of columns is not equal to a certain number, for the original column count number, we are concatenating our data column count variable at the very end. So tomorrow you might want to import six columns or seven columns. That will reflect back here as well. So let's test this. First, we'll check this side of the equation. Let's change this to six. So that's definitely wrong. Let's run this and we get a columns mismatch message. Okay. Source file got closed. That's good to know. Change this back to five and let's check this side of the equation. 
we'll open the August data file. Add in some column. Let's put in some dummy values. Save this. Now the column count out here is six. Come back to our code. Let's run this. And again, we get a mismatch. So it works both ways. Awesome. Let's just let's correct this. Save. Close this. Great. Moving on. Next is the last, the most complex, and the most interesting check. We'll check whether the header names in the source data match what we expect in a headers worksheet. One point to note here is that we are only checking whether the header names match. We have already checked whether the total column counts match or not. What we are not going to be checking for is whether the header names appear in the right sequence. We can check that as well, but I will leave that code as out of scope for this course. We will assume that that will be a rare occurrence and ignore that possibility. Okay, come to our header worksheet. First, we will determine the last row in the header worksheet. We'll be looping over each value and searching for it in the source header row using the find function. And the last row is the number of rows in the current region of the header worksheet. Let's dim a variable to hold the last row and assign it the count of the rows in the current region. We've covered this code in our previous macros, so we'll move on. Now, the find function will require us to specify the range of data to search in. This is the range in the header row in the source data. So let's just put this row into a range object variable. Let's dim a range object variable. And let's set it. So this is actually going to be a part of this larger data set, which is the current region which includes the header row as well. So we will refer to the range source variable. And what part of this range are we really after? We are after the first row. So we'll get the rows property. And we will specifically refer to just the first row. The way to do that is provide the row index as shown down in the helper window. So this statement will return the first row, which is the header row, which is also a range object, which in turn we will assign to our new range header variable. Now let's begin to construct the for loop to iterate over the header list in our template file. The for loop needs a variable that will increment by one for each iteration of the loop. So this will be a counter variable. Let's dim it. Adding in more space, we will begin our loop from row one to the last row, which we have already found above. Our for loop starts with the word for. The counter variable is equal to the lowest value that we want to start our loop from, which is one to the last row, which is this variable right here. And let's close the loop. And why are we starting from one? That's because our data starts from the first row as well. Let's grab the first header name that we want to search for. For each iteration of the loop, the header name will be the value of the current cell in column A of the header worksheet. So in the first iteration of the loop, the first cell in column A will be this cell right here. First, let's declare a string variable to hold the name of that cell value. Place it here. Now let's assign a value to this variable. So equal to, we're looking in the header worksheet dot and we'll just be iterating or looping over the rows in column A. And we want to refer to the current cell in column A. And the current row number is given by our counter variable i, which we can just concatenate to the column. And let's grab the value. Now, the result of the find function will need to be stored in a range. Let's dim a variable for that range. I'm 
we call it range find. So what we are going to do now is we are going to set the value of this range find variable to equal to the result of the find function. Let's do that. We need to first specify the range that we want to search in and we've already saved that as the range header. The find function is a method of the range object. Let's invoke it. This function can take as many as nine parameters, but we will only provide two. First is the value that we are searching for. So what are we searching for? We are searching for a match for this report column name, which is the value of our header in our original data set. And the next parameter specifies that we want the entire or whole cell to match this value and not just a part. So let's feed that parameter. It is the look at parameter. And the options are either Excel part or Excel whole. We will choose Excel whole. In close brackets. This range find variable is empty or rather there is nothing in it to begin with. So if the find function finds a match, the range find variable will get populated with the matching cell from the header row. But we are not really concerned with finding a match. We want to isolate the instance where there is no match or rather where the range find variable remains empty. So if this was a string variable, the way to check that would be if this range find variable is blank, then, and then we'll do an end if, but this will not work for an object variable. In simple terms, either an object variable has something in it or it has nothing in it. So the correct condition would be if the range find variable is nothing, then this is basically our if condition right here. And if this gets triggered, then we'll do the same thing. Message box, close the source file, turn the screen updating back to true and exit the sub. Paste it in. Let's test this by first running it as is. And as this test would confirm whether all our logic here is correct or not. So let's do that. Save the file, run it. No errors found, OK to continue, which means our logic here is correct. Now let's change something. Let's change this to products. So there will be a mismatch on the headers. Let's run this. And we get a message saying mismatch in column headers. Click OK. Let's turn this back. And great, that was the last of our checks. And I must apologize out here for putting you through this last check. I know I claimed at the start of the course that the intention is to get you to a beginner level of understanding of VBA. But this code right here is going well into intermediate territory. My God, we are doing an if statement inside a for loop. And not just that, we have put in a find function in the midst of it all as well. And there are so many variables for ranges. And it might be a tough to follow what ranges for what. So it's completely fine if you did not follow this through. I did not want to say this disclaimer at the start to discourage you from actually going through this last check. If you followed this through and understood, awesome. If you didn't, absolutely no problem at all. You will get there through practice. And if you wanted to use this macro in your own real life project and you were not 100% confident about this logic, just don't include it. We have five checks out here and we're even checking for a column count mismatch. So this column header mismatch is a bit of an overkill. Good to have, but not really necessary. So completely up to you. Now let's go back to our console sheet and add in a button. Develop a tab, insert, form controls and button. Come up here, make a rectangle, choose the error handling sub, click OK. Edit text, we'll call this check errors, save your file. And just for the pure satisfaction of having come so far, let's run through each step one by one. First, check for errors. No errors found, okay to continue. 
Thank you macro. Click OK. Import data complete as well. Let's create a copy. Creates a copy as well. And last, let's send the email. And our email gets populated. Close. No. That concludes this bonus section. You can choose to end here as well. We have built a stable four step macro that completes the end to end task. And I will highly recommend that as a beginner, this is how you should design your projects to be run in individual steps. But can we automate this process fully you ask? Why surely? Let's head on over to the next and final segment of this project where we'll see VBA in its full glory or in other words, 100% automation. See you there. This final macro will combine all the four macros that we have built till now. Building a macro that calls out the macros is rather simple, but as we will soon see, it will be necessary to adjust some of the macros to suit end-to-end -end automation. But before we begin, make sure to save your previous file and let's save this file now with a different name. This is to make sure that you have a copy of the error handling macro that we built in the previous segment. Save as, we'll call this full automation. Click save. Okay. First up, let's add a new worksheet called errors. Here, we're going to print out the error message instead of displaying it in a separate message box. Now let's go to the VB editor, Alt F11. Let's create a new module. Right click, insert module, rename this to main. Just a quick note out here. I just want to highlight how I've named my modules. This is the way I design my projects. You might want to choose to do it differently. However, I've made sure that my modules line up with the main module as the first one. Let's create a new sub, full proc. Now let's browse through our previous modules. We have created a total of four macros. Let's ignore the error handling macro for now. What we will do is call each macro one after the other from our main sub. The code to call a macro is call and add the macro name. We don't need to put the word call, but I prefer it since it makes it easy to understand the code. Okay, let's go to the first module. Grab the sub name. Call it here. Go to the next module. Grab the sub name. And the third one. Save the file. Let's run this sub for now. We get a message that the first macro ran. This is for the second macro. And finally, our email is displayed. That was easy, wasn't it? At least compared to what we have achieved so far. What we'll do now is remove those messages from the first and second macro. So let's go to our first module, come all the way down. Instead of removing this, I'm just gonna comment it out. So just added the apostrophe. That way the code will ignore this line. If I'm ever in doubt that I may just use a line of code later on, then instead of deleting it outright, it's better just to comment it out. And let's go to the second macro. Comment this out as well. Come back to our main sub, save the file and let's run this. And that ran smoothly. Now let's add our error handling macro. Now this macro has a lot of messages in case something goes wrong. If we remove them, then we need to figure out another way to alert the user that an error has occurred. What we will do is instead of displaying the error in a message box, we will display or print out the error message in the error worksheet that we created at the start of the segment. First, let's assign a variable to the error worksheet. So call that WS error and we'll set it here below. And let's come to our first message box. Let's update each message box to print out the value in cell A1 in the error worksheet instead. Delete the message box. 
So we need to refer to the range A1 in the error worksheet. And we want to set its value to equal to this string value. And let's do this for each message box. And finally, let's comment out the success message. Save the file. Let's just run this sub as is. Hmm. We get a runtime error from Visual Basic. Uh, that's good. We haven't seen one of these so far. So if you ever see one of these, either you can end this and exit out of the sub completely, but then you wouldn't know where the error is because this message isn't referring to any particular line of code. What you would rather do is hit debug so click this and we'll be taken to the line of code where the error is. So in this particular instance, our error is in this set statement. Since this is a simple line of code, the only possible error out here could be that I have misspelled this worksheet name, which is possible. Let's check. Okay. It's actually called errors, not error. So let's come here and update this. Now we have two options. We can either stop or reset the macro and rerun it, or we can just hit play and the macro will continue from this line of code onwards. So in this instance, I'm going to hit play. Okay. That macro has completed running. And now what we will do is we will just feed in an error, update this to six. So we are now going to expect a mismatch for the data column counts. Come back to our macro. Let's run this now. The macro ran. Usually in the previous segment, we would have expected a message box, but we have now changed all of them for the error message to get printed in the error worksheet instead. So let's head on over to our error worksheet. And there in the first cell, we get a message saying that there's a column mismatch. Awesome. So that part of code is working fine. Let's change this back. Let's go to our main sub and call the error handling sub. I'd rather just copy variables rather than writing them out separately. Okay. We do need to code in some logic here. If an error is detected by the error handling sub, then we need to alert the user and not run the remaining macros. So how do we detect that an error has occurred? We will check whether the value in cell A1 in the error worksheet is blank or not after this macro runs. If it is blank, we will continue with the rest of the sub. If it is not blank and an error is detected, we will alert the user and exit out of this full sub. So let's code this into our main sub. First, let's assign a variable to the error worksheet and set it. Need to update this to errors. Okay. Next, we will clear out the value from cell A1 in the error worksheet before the error handling macro runs. This is to clear out any errors populated from a previous run of the macro. So we can just set the value of range A1 in the error worksheet to equal to blank. After the error handling macro runs, we will use an if statement to check if the value in cell A1 is blank or not. If it is not, then we will display a message that an error has occurred. So if the value in cell A1 in the error worksheet is not blank, then close off the if statement first. We will display a message saying that one error has occurred and we will activate the error worksheet. What this means is that when we run our code, we are starting from the console sheet, but if an error occurs, VBA will bring up the error sheet. So the code for that is the worksheet and choose the activate method. In fact, it's the very first one. And lastly, if an error has occurred, we do not want to continue with the rest of the sub and we'll exit out. 
Great. Save this. Let's give this a run. Our email gets displayed. So the macro ran through and through all okay. Close this. Let's come here and create a deliberate error. This time we'll change the file extension out here. So our third check, if you remember, checks for the file extension. Save the file, run the macro. Great, we get an error message, click OK. And our email did not get displayed, which means that we did exit out of the sub. And let's just check if the error worksheet has been displayed. Go back to our file. And yes, we are on our error worksheet. This will be more apparent when we run the full macro from our button. Okay, come back here, come to console, change this back. We're almost done for this project. The very last thing now is actually creating a button. So what we're gonna do is delete all this off. We'll insert a brand new button and we'll assign the full proc macro to it. Rename this just call this a very simple name run save the file no matter how simple or complex macros i build there is a certain sense of satisfaction of just clicking this button and seeing a macro run so for the very last time in our project let's click on this button and see a full macro in action click run and the email gets displayed. Awesome. At this stage, if you're the analyst, if everything looks good out here, give it a quick check. And if everything looks good, click the send button. Close. If you really want to go the extreme step and if you're confident that you've completely understood how to send an email, you can change the you can change the display method to dot send. But I'm going to leave that up to you. And just the very last thing I wanted to show was let's force an error and run this macro. What I just want to check is that we will get an error message, but after we click the error message, I want the error sheet to get activated. So let's do that. Run. We get an error message as expected. Click OK. And immediately the user is taken to the error worksheet where they can view the error and fix it. Great. I'm going to save this file and that's it. Fantastic. And that is our 100% fully automated end-to-end -end reporting project. That was a mighty effort to get here. I hope you've enjoyed it. Before we finish this video, let's do a final wrap-up session. If you have completed the video and reached here, then congratulations, you are now a VBA developer. You have the skill set to confidently manipulate data in Excel. The next step is to practice and explore the internet for new code to conquer. If you found this video useful, please do like and subscribe. If you're going to use this macro or just parts of it in your work environment, I would love to know it in the comments below. Also, please let me know if you want to see more project style videos like this one. Feel free to make suggestions. These videos take quite a while to make, so I may not be able to get to them all, but I'll do my best. And that's it. Have fun playing around with the code. Be sure to visit the links below to grab the code and supporting files. I really enjoyed planning, building and compiling this video together. Thank you and I'll see you in the next one.